my name is Emily Vinyl. Before we get into the discussion, I thought it would be a good idea for me to briefly introduce myself. I am currently studying international relations at the University of Geneva. And as many of you know, I've been coming here as a guest for many years, by choice, not by, by force. Um, and I'm an novice at investing, but I'm very passionate and very intrigued to learn more. And I think that's something that brings us all together. And that is the framework and also the aim of today's discussion. It's just the, demonstrating the passion that exists within this world, within this industry, and just discussing why it sh should attract more women and maybe why and how it has failed to do so so far. And um, I would like to ask the course, first question to you, Alex, Fatima, and Sophia, just to briefly introduce yourself and maybe tell us about how or when you caught the investing bug. So maybe Alex, you can start. Well, good, good morning. Uh, my name is Alex Douglas. Before we start for compliance reasons, I just have to say quickly that um, the views and opinions expressed here today are my own and do not <laughs> reflect those of my firm, Investor. Um, and I also would like to thank Rob uh, for including me uh, this year. Uh, this is a really lovely event and I've enjoyed participating, so thank you. Um, so like I said, my name is Alex. I'm a managing director at Investor. Um, we are an OCIO, meaning an outsourced chief investment office um, in Charlottesville, Virginia, which is about two or two and a half hours um, south of Washington, D.C. in the United States. Um, we manage the investment portfolio on behalf of a select group of U.S. endowments and foundations. Um, prior to that, I was at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, I was on the investment team there. Uh, and that's the largest U.S. Uh, philanthropy focused solely on health. And before that, I was at the Georgetown University uh, Investment Office. Um, I had a rather non-traditional um, uh, path to investing. My background is not usual for um, uh, investors in the space. It was a bit circuitous. Um, and that was, so in terms of catching the bug, um, really, um, I, when I was in college, I was very interested, like, like you, um, Amelie, in uh, international relations, international affairs. Um, and so for the first four years out of college, I actually did not work. Uh, I worked in businesses that were unrelated uh, to the industry. And then, um, thanks to a, a very good uh, mentor of mine, I wound up working in the investment office, um, rather by chance. Uh, and that was because I thought I wanted to go to law school. Uh, and I was working, I started in um, an operational and a legal role there, really to support my enrollment at Georgetown Law. Um, and I was at the law program uh, for all of one semester. I realized very quickly uh, that that was not a fit. Um, I, <laughs> Yes, it, that's a story for another day, but um, didn't like how my mind was being used, didn't like the way I was thinking. Um, and, uh, and Georgetown at that time was actually undergoing a CIO transition. And so um, it was during that time that I decided against continuing the law program that I transitioned over to the investment side of the office. Um, and uh, Georgetown's current CIO, who's a mentor and a friend, um, I actually followed in his footsteps. I wound up um, attending a program uh, in the DC area that was um, essentially a political economy. It was for folks who were mid-career mid professionals um, and you could build your own course of study. And so I wound up um, essentially um, thinking about where we were looking to make investments uh, for Georgetown and then studying those countries uh, and then traveling to do diligence um, on the ground in those places. And I absolutely loved it. Um, and so I think that's where, where I caught the bug. Great. Fatima? Hi. Thank you for inviting me to speak uh, today. Um, uh, my name is Fatima Dickey. I, uh, my office is based in New York City. I run, I, I founded my small investment uh, company about 10 years ago. I can't believe it went so fast. It's called Lagoda Investment Management. Um, and uh, uh, it's a long only shop, uh, global investing. Uh, I know when I caught my f investment bug. It was when I had my first job. I was investment banking. I didn't uh, particularly love investment banking, but I, I realized I love reading the research reports. And then I realized uh, that uh, I can make money. Uh, and then when I uh, basically speculated my way into an MBA and finance it through speculation during the internet bubble, um, you know, I realized I was, you know, infected. And I really, from that point on, uh, I thought, you know, that's the only job for me. It fits my personality, and I really want to learn more. I mean, the speculation was fun, but uh, I'm pretty sure, sure that's not what it's all about. And I made a choice to join an investment organization, a private, uh, a private um, a firm, private wealth management firm in New York City, and spent 14 years there. Uh, it was a wonderful time. Uh, most of most of the time, it gave me a lot of space 
to become an investor. Uh, I co-managed a fund then in 2010. I actually pitched and launched my own global uh, fund. It really was my strategy as it is today, kind of uh, was born and, and evolved, but the bug was there and the bug was about, um, this is an empowering thing that you can make money and grow your wealth uh, with your own, um, you know, with your own brain, with reading stuff, with observing the world, uh, you know, and, and that was really the, the initial sort of hook. It is empowering and interesting. Okay, I'm in. <laughs> Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Sophia, and also for compliance reasons, I have to make a disclaimer that all views uh, are my own today and not reflective of my uh, former or current employer. So with that, um, I'm an investor currently based in Boston. I'm an investor within an international equity strategy that sits on top of a very large private wealth um, platform. Uh, my childhood dream was to become like an animator at Pixar, so, and, then, and then I ended up in investing. Um, so, you know, a, quite a different pathway, but I studied, I was born in China, um, an immigrant um, from the age of six to Canada. I studied statistics actually in university, um, also not a lot to do with fundamentals investing, um, but then I ended up becoming an investor surely because I fell into it. Um, when I was in college, I did a couple of clubs in investing, kind of gave up after two years because I was more interested in international relations. I did two internships on Wall Street uh, in sales and trading. That was about FX options trading, credit structuring, um, like converts trading. Not a great personality fit. So when I got to uh, my last year in university, I was freaking out. Like, what did I want to do with my life? So I took over 30 interviews across consulting, um, tech, so product management, uh, and, and all of the verticals within finance, all of them. Banking, private equity, um, investment management. Uh, and I was very lucky because there was a team um, within Grant the Mayo Van Allerloo or GMO in Boston that was hiring a junior analyst and I went to the interview and I literally took the job because I loved the interview process. I was like, wow, this was an interview that really made me think about businesses, never really thought about that before. Um, it had a really fun math component that I loved and um, the people were very young and they're like, you know, come join us. We're gonna teach you everything. You don't have to know anything about finance. All we promise you is that um, we will give you as much responsibility as you can possibly handle and you get to travel. I'm like, I'm in. Um, and I guess from there, the rest was history. I feel like there's more unconventional ways to becoming an investor than there are conventional, so great to hear. Um, and maybe very briefly just talk over your methodology or how you invest. Maybe with Fatima you can start. Okay. Um, well, I really uh, am a long-term investor and uh, for me, um, uh, for me, there's some things I don't want to go too much into, you know, all the particulars of my strategy, but I really basically view uh, an investment like a journey. And I ask myself, you know, do I want to go on this journey with these people? And why are we going on this journey? And so, you know, there are essentially two types of companies in my portfolio. The ones that have already proven that they are very successful and I want to join their caravan and, and basically join this compounding expedition and, and, uh, and, and the second part of the companies where they're going uh, on a journey because there is a, a treasure uh, and you know you have to get through the jungle and you, you ask yourself okay do I want to go with these people and who are they and why why are we going why, why, why is it worth it to spend five years uh, joining this expedition and so for me I call my strategy owners and dominators as well as uh, investors and operators and that's that's these are the lens through which I view things so, um, you know, for me, owners, just like for Rob's, are very important because they're the leaders of the expedition. And if you're going to decide to go through a jungle with somebody, you're definitely going to want to know that the leaders are, you know, going to be the people that, first of all, I love the asymmetry. I'm just going to join the expedition at the end of the caravan. I'm not doing anything, but good things and bad things can happen to me because I joined this expedition. So who is the guy leading it? And uh, I want to know that, you know, for me, that's 5% of my, my portfolio. And, and for them, it's their baby. 
uh, it's uh, everything, the, the entire wealth in the family, um, maybe, um, you know, and, and I want to know other things. Uh, you know, is it a, you know, what I love is, for example, finding great problem solvers. Um, on the way to, um, to, to here, I was reading this book by Brad Jacobs with a little pompous title, How to Make a Few Billion Dollars. But, uh, you know, I invested in Brad Jacobs five years ago and I thought, well, what an amazing problem solver. Uh, because yeah, if you think about it this way, you know, I want the leader of my expedition. There will be problems on the way to this treasure. And I, I really want them to, to, to solve problems. And he has an amazing quote there, which I knew when I first uh, investigated him. Uh, uh, he said, you know, early in his career, a mentor told him, um, when he was down because there was a problem that, that he was trying to solve, uh, a mentor told him, look, Brad, uh, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, uh, you're in business, you need to uh, find problems, actually embrace the problems, enjoy the problems, and then solve the problems. And, and I was like, I want to be with this guy too. And that's kind of how I think about owners. I, I wanted that feeling, I trust him, I want to be with him, I, I'm gonna therefore go on this expedition. People think that you join the owners because they have the vision, but again, I think a lot of people can have the vision. I worry more about, that's a great vision, I like it, but are they gonna you know, solve problems? And the other thing is, do they, are they the kind of people that will create intelligent organisms? So I like owners, but ultimately, I'm looking for intelligent organisms. So I like owners who know how to create one. Um, because sometimes maybe they step down from what they're doing and, and Brad is no longer with XPO. I think he created an intelligent organism. So really, the way I think about due diligence and what I'm looking for is I'm really for, looking for owner-operated companies around the world that have, I'm looking for intelligent signs of life um, you know, out there that are created in these organizations, companies that dominate their areas, people who are either have the successful recipe already that I can just join up, or people who are looking to create new ones. I mean, today we have Trepanian CEO, he's telling us he's looking for Nirvana, for example, right? So, you know, they're, we're all looking for something and, uh, you know, it's a collection for my portfolio of these businesses around the world, large, medium, and small, developed, less developed, and there's some crazy, amazing people who are totally looking for something that hasn't been invented yet. And, you know, uh, yeah. get together this collection and uh, pay attention to who's running the shows in each, and do they really have advantage? Do they dominate something? Do they have investment Great. recipe, and who's guarding it? I think I'll stop you there, then um, stop, me. Ask, stop me. <laughs> ask Alex to take over. <laughs> Sure. So, so unsurprisingly, my, uh, my, my view of all this has been informed very much by sort of my, my allocator seat, if you will, on behalf of institutions. Um, I will note maybe up front just quickly in terms of our business model, because there are different forms of OCIO out there. Um, we are, um, the way we approach our, our portfolio um, is uh, we manage 100% of our clients' assets. We have full discretion over them, um, and we don't customize accounts. So um, even though it's an, it's an outsourced model, um, we are very much um, thinking as investors, we're not just consultants um, alongside our, our clients. Um, and of course, when I was at RWJF and, and Georgetown, that was, that was the case too, right? You're serving as a fiduciary. But, um, but in broad brushstrokes, what I'd say um, in terms of my, um, my philosophy, look, it's, it's maintaining a long-term uh, perspective on things, just given um, sort of the, the institutions on, on, uh, that we serve um, and that are looking to exist into perpetuity. Um, we're trying to maximize return um, uh, while managing around the risk tolerance and time horizons of those institutions and, and in keeping with prudent practice. Um, I think, you know, there's an importance for me of having a, a macro awareness. So, uh, you know, being, uh, having that top-down perspective, but simultaneously really focusing on the fundamentals of um, the risk return contours of each opportunity. So when you think about sort of the global set of opportunities you could be allocating to, where do you want to allocate? Um, capital uh, when, when it's limited. Um, and, and then at the end of the day, look, this is a, this is a business of people. And so I can, you know, people matter and process matters. Thank you, Sophia. Um, thank you. So I guess for me, there was like two parts of my career that really influenced how I thought about investing. And the first part, I actually really want to thank Rob because when I started this investing career, my, my boss met Rob on a trip to China and was like, Sophia, there's like one thing you read like you need to read Rob's letters. And so my investment philosophy from the very beginning was very, very focused on finding really good businesses, um, you know, 
backed by really, really great people with amazing mo moats. So it's like no different um, than a lot of you know, true value investors out there who are looking for great compounders. And then what the second part that really influenced my career was my time actually at SoftBank when I was working with more operators, founders, getting into the nitty gritty of companies, looking at companies that were, you know, very young, immature. How do you evaluate those companies? They can still be great companies. They're still building their moat. They're still kind of coming out of that moat. They're trying to figure out real scaling problems. Um, and that really got me to think a lot harder about like truly understand like management teams, execution. A company is just, it's, it's organic. Just like Fatima said, it's made of people and teams and you want to find great businesses that have a really deep bench who can solve a lot of problems. There's going to be short attacks. There's gonna be regulatory changes. How do you navigate those problems? Um, and and you want, I always look for companies that either have like what modes that will go through really tough times or a really solid management teams that are able to pivot in different directions when things go wrong. So I'm not, I don't discriminate between, I personally I am an angel investor as well. So I've looked at everything from zero to one, from one to 10, from 10 to a hundred. And, and those who are like, you know, hundred year old companies in Japan that have, that are going through transformations as well. So being able to price that risk, being able to think about where they are, um, how you think about the entry price and what you're getting out of it, those all kind of go into an investment process. And right now I have to admit, it's still, it's still a journey for me. My, my investment philosophy, it's still growing, it's still evolving. Um, it's still changing from the world, the, the way the world works, that's dynamic and from all the different investors I learned from. So it's, it's still an ongoing process that I'm, I'm kind of going through. Very good. Um, my next question is gonna get right to the, the topic uh, of this discussion. Um, and it's the following, um, why do you think, or seeing that it is so male dominated, where does the industry kind of fail to attract women's attention? And uh, whoever wants to answer first can go ahead. I'm I'm happy. <laughs> maybe, uh, um, maybe I start with a, a, an energizing anecdote because that actually happened to me. And so I actually didn't know I was a woman portfolio manager until a particular moment in my career. I was already a managing director and at this point actually managing my own fund, which I created the strategy for. So I was definitely, you know, not, not a young person early on, but somewhat advanced in my career. And I remember this was 2012, I was underperforming and uh, some people were mad at me. And this other managing director came in and said, you know, are, you know, basically saying you don't like your performance, what's happening. And at some point he said, you're just a pretty face. And I thought, wow, that's, that's a very not nice way of uh, describing someone's performance. And I thought, I think the universe is telling me I'm, I'm a woman as well as a portfolio manager because this would, this would never happen. So, you know, it wasn't anything big in the scheme of thing, but I think as a woman, sooner or later, you're on this journey of being a manager and you don't think of yourself, you're just following your interests, your passion, you're following what you're good at. And then, uh, you know, there are certain problems, certain things that happen that, that, that you become aware well, in addition to that, you, you, you're a woman as well, kind of a thing, you know, and that makes it a little bit harder. Not, it doesn't kill you, uh, but maybe, uh, maybe that there's some additional things that happen that make it a little bit harder. Yeah, I, I might uh, phrase it just as challenges uh, rather than what attracts women or not, because there is a lot to love in this industry. You know, I love, I love thinking globally and having to keep up with a range of industries and um, geopolitics and secular trends and um, uh, thinking quantitatively and qualitatively, right? That analytical rigor is absolutely a part of it, but there's also discretion and emotional intelligence and discretion, right? And um, so there are many, many parts of it um, that, that are just wonderful and I think can, can be of interest both to men and women. I think in terms of challenges though for, for women um, in general, a couple things. One I would say is examples. So they're just, you know, because historically there have been, it has been a more uh, male dominated industry, there aren't that many women that you can point to that are in you know, places of power. And if you don't see yourself or someone who looks like you, you know, doing something, it's, it's harder to imagine that as a career path um, for yourself. And certainly, and this, this may be a US centric comment, but, um, you know, in the US, the, the recruiting for the street starts very early. Uh, you know, people start getting internships. Um, 
freshman year, sophomore year, they start, and, and so if you didn't know that this was, like me, you know, no one in my family had ever done finance, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't kind of on my radar as an undergrad, um, you're sort of behind the eight ball, even when you graduate from school, if you haven't had internships and done these things. And so um, I think, you know, not having the example, and therefore maybe starting out, and then you're, you're kind of on your back, back foot. Another thing I would say is, um, just in terms of general challenges, um, I, I think there's a little bit of a disconnect between the way women are socialized, and again, this will be very specific by country and culture, so I may be, this may be a very American perspective, but um, there's a little bit of a disconnect, I think, between the, the way women are socialized when it's in a non-business context and what is really necessary in the investment in an investment role. Um, and so, for example, I can't tell you, and I know um, Fatima and I have talked about this, where there have been a number of young women, you know, over the course of my career that, that I've spoken to, the thoughts are there, the opinions are there, they're very strong, they're very talented, and I've said, speak up. You know, when we're in an investment community, don't be afraid, you know, project your voice. Don't be afraid to give your opinion, even if you don't feel like you have a 100% view of, of exactly, you know, what something is, or you feel like you don't have all parts of it in your mind completely ironed out. And I think that's something where, you know, sometimes there can be a stylistic element that, you know, for better or worse, we're in an industry of type A go-getters. Um, and if you're in a room and you don't project a certain amount of confidence or um, aggr aggression is the wrong word, but just, um, uh, you know, you cannot be taken seriously or be viewed as not having a viewpoint. And sometimes that's just stylistic. And I think, and so I think there's a little bit for women, sometimes there's this disconnect between how you would behave if you were in a non-business setting and how you behave and need to behave, you know, when you're in, um, in the business world. And then lastly, I'd say um, mentor, mentor, mentors are very important. I think it was Fred on the last panel um, who made this point, and I completely agree that, you know, at the risk of stating the totally obvious, you know, men relate to men differently than they relate to women. Women relate to women differently than they relate to men. Um, and so when you get, I think, you know, in the early stages of the industry, you'll see a lot of young women. Um, but when you get to that inflection point of where the talent, you know, where you really need to get sort of moving up in your career, a lot of times that's dominated by men. And I think that's just sometimes not as easy or natural, um, you know, a, a, a greasing of the wheels, if you will, uh, for, for women. Um, Sophia, just quickly, I'm curious to, because you say you do a lot of, or you research a lot in Chinese markets, uh, Asia, how that differs from maybe our predominantly Western perspective. Yeah, so it's interesting. I never realized I was like a woman in a role um, until really I started in the workplace after my first job in the US. My first job was wonderful, so it almost protected me. But as a have, being a child growing up in the one like under the one child policy in China, my first conference in Asia was incredible. Fifty percent women and men, like so many women out there in the investing industry. And I think growing up Chinese, it's not like my parents ever never told me, oh you're a woman, you can't do anything. They only have one child. Like for most Chinese people, that's the social welfare right there. You better invest just as much into your daughters as your sons. And that is like, that's why you're, we're always pushed into science, mathematics, and engineering majors. Um, and what my parents told me was like, you know, engineering is like, you know, like a really hard industry for, why don't you go into finance? That seems like a great job for a woman. So I actually didn't even know that like, you know, there would be, there would be issues because my mom said, yeah, engineering, that's hard. That like uses too much brains. You're coding all the time, like not social, like you should go into finance. I was like, yeah, great. Like, you know, you get to talk to a lot of people. The job itself is very wonderful. Um, so I, like from a Chinese background, it's, it's almost like it's almost a better culture, I thought, in, in, in China, or at least what I saw when I was in Hong Kong, Shanghai, than what I got to um, when I really started to get to know the US industry. Um, which I think one thing I wanted to add for the reason why a lot of women don't probably, even, even if they know about this industry, don't want to continue in this industry, it's just because there's not a lot of places with amazing culture. It is a, it's, it's so funny, it's a job that is 100% human capital, but some of the worst human capital management I have ever seen in my life. <laughs> um, like as a woman, I was told when, when I was too soft-spoken, you need to be more confident. And then when I got my confidence, I was told, you're aggressive. <laughs> Tone that down. <laughs> it's like, it's just, there's no, um, there's no middle ground. You can't, your, 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 your bar is just set so differently. And so as you try to move up, there's almost an invisible ceiling that because you're a woman, your bar is just very different. Yeah, and ultimately when you move up, you have to be prepared to break some male egos. There's a lot of money and a lot of male egos floating around in this industry. 
and you run into it eventually. Um, last question before I open the floor for your questions is maybe just very briefly, and I know this is an extremely difficult question, but if there's like young women watching this, listening to this, what is kind of the main takeaway, or if they are slightly interested but are not sure whether they want to go down this route, what would be your advice for them? Uh, my advice would be if you, ha it's an extremely empowering skill to uh, be able to understand the f how to manage money uh, yourself, how to create wealth with, you know, your brain. Um, so it's extremely empowering, extremely interesting. You can learn a lot about the world uh, if, if you're in this job. And it's not all Wolf on Wall Street. In fact, not at all. So, the, you know, don't watch TV, don't watch the movies. Uh, they don't tell you anything about this job. Sometimes I, I almost feel like I want to make the movie about this job because there are no good protagonists except for Warren Buffett. If they make a movie about him, that, that would be a great movie, but he is not a woman either. So, you know, don't watch TV, don't watch TV. Yeah. Yeah. So, empowering, super interesting, and absolutely a job for a woman. Um, oh, I guess what I would say is the, the job itself is wonderful. The job description is like you get paid to learn about everything and anything and travel everywhere and meet really cool people and eat great food. There is, there is, if you look at the job description, it is almost like a dream job. I feel so entitled to be here. Um, so if you are someone who looks at this industry, look at the job description and then if you're in it and you're like struggling, think about, is it the job that I actually dislike or is it the environment I dislike? Um, because you have to really differentiate between that because people who are toxic, just like um, Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett said in their last AGM, that is the worst. That can make you really hate something. I almost gave up on this job because I was in a very toxic environment. And then I realized, I love this job. I just really didn't like the people I was with because they made me feel awful. And then when you start to think like that, I think you, you have to be in survival mode. You're like, well, I need to surround myself with better people and stick it through, like tough it out, because it's truly rewarding at the end. I, I would echo that completely. I think number one, you can do it. Uh, number two, you are capable. It's a great job for a woman. And if you like to think globally, if you like to think quantitatively and qualitatively, if you like um, to meet some of the most interesting people that you ever have in your life and to be really challenged and to continually learn, this is, a, this is the job for you. Great, so ending on a positive note. Um, if anyone has a question, right at the back first maybe, or, okay. Uh, could you enlighten myself and some of the other men in the room some of the inherent advantages of being a woman in this job? Uh, okay, well, this is how I think about it, because I do think about it. I think, uh, I think, uh, I think that uh, as a woman, I often thought that uh, I couldn't be, for example, maybe uh, an activist manager, because I don't think, well, I could do your job better than you. I'm nicer, in fact, uh, and uh, I also think that uh, I pay attention to a lot of uh, intangibles, so my approach to doing due diligence is not just numbers, 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 numbers. It's really, who is this person? How can I, I know that he, he owns the company, and but really just do I, how could I trust him? How do I, could I like him? Again, this idea of an expedition, what I get on, it's, it's, it's really a lot of valuing things that are extremely valuable, but they're actually not valued. So I actually think inherently, when I think about my strategy and what I do, is that whatever can be quantified is quantified already. So you can pursue things that people don't like at a particular moment or don't value things. And I value things like commitment, determination. I ask myself these questions. Are these people committed? Do they seem determined? Uh, do they love what they do? And I value that. And I think that is, uh, that is the kind of a point of view um, that is maybe a little bit different from a man that's gonna just maybe, maybe more likely to do just the spreadsheet, I don't know. Then also loyalty. I'm more likely to be a long-term shareholder, I think, uh, when I think that people are really making a huge effort. You know, to, this year, I wrote the best Christmas card to the worst performing 
company in my portfolio. And I told them specifically, I value you. I know the market doesn't, but I see how you guys are trying. They're doing amazing things. And instead of a man saying, you know, hey, you are the worst performing stock in my portfolio, um, please explain. So I think those things help. And you know what? They were so um, ecstatic receiving this Christmas card. And you know, they're building a business and they're going, they're going after an amazing treasure. And I think it was the woman in me that, that, that wrote that card, you know? I, I do think women have a, a differentiated perspective in many cases to men. And again, that just goes to, you know, our brains are different. We relate differently. Um, uh, that also probably is a function of the fact that, again, I have a non-traditional background. So I, I actually think that's worked, you know, that's not specific to being a woman, but um, that's also been helpful. I do think also that women have, um, and, and I hate to speak in generalities about uh, or stereotypes because it's just, it, it really doesn't, it's not helpful in many respects. But, but here I do think that women have, um, oftentimes, they have soft skills in a way that, call it diplomacy, call it um, treading lightly, uh, maybe for some of those reasons I mentioned about uh, socialization, sometimes less threatening, wh whatever that might be, uh, which could also be, you know, the flip side of that being that, that you can be viewed as not serious. But I think it can also help people lower their guards a bit. And so in an environment where it can be, it's, you know, it's highly competitive, type A's, um, et cetera, I think sometimes women can be very useful in terms of getting information that would otherwise be missed or seeing nuances that, that others might not see or greasing the wheels. There's something to be said for just connecting, you know, if, if people lower their guards, you know, that allows for, for communication in a way that, that could otherwise be missed. Yep. Absolutely. Is there... Okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was listening to this fact that what are the advantages of, of women, you know? And I think that overall our industry is a complete failure, you know, the equity management fund industry. Uh, most of the funds don't outperform the index, so we should open the door to women and have a chance on that, you know? I mean, male dominated for the last 30 years, not a good outcome, so what can we lose? All in the front, and then there was someone in the back that was first. Thank you. Um, so, the, yeah, there's a really cool uh, organization in the UK called uh, Girls Are Investors or, or GAIN. Um, yeah, just interested in, in any organizations like that that you know, can really promote uh, women investing, particularly as women are coming out of college or even uh, in the sort of late stages of high school that you've come across you know, that you would recommend uh, to, to budding investors? I know in the US there's an organization also called Girls Who Invest. They also help out a lot of um, high school students who are interested in investing. And I, in, but I really actually think um, university, at least in the US, is a very, very great fertile ground for, for doing that because a lot of your upperclassmen will want to transfer their knowledge to underclassmen who are willing and, and, and looking and interested in that, in that. So that is a great ground. Don't be turned away by, by you know, if you're intimidated by that environment, because um, when I looked at all the investment clubs out there, like who would be most helpful to me as a woman? I joined an all male <laughs> investment club because I was like, you know what? Like, I also want to break into that circle. I want to, I want to talk to, be in an environment I'm not comfortable with. Um, so there's a lot of different good organizations out there, you know, universities, um, good, yeah. Um, I want to. One of my favorite saying is, a "Charity starts at home," and so if you think that you have a chance to uh, have a, a girl as an intern, uh, take it on. I take a lot of interns. Eighty percent of them who come up uh, to want to intern with me over the years have been guys. Twenty percent girls. Uh, but uh, whenever I get a chance to take on a, a woman intern, uh, I, I basically remember, "Charity starts at home," and there's another girl you can, you know. Uh, learn about the business. So actually, um, let's do. Uh, let's all do that. 
I, I was actually going to echo on Girls Who Invest. Um, that's the US, it sounds like the, maybe the U.S. equivalent to, to what you mentioned. And um, what's nice about them is they'll actually bring in. When I was at the Georgetown Investment Office, for example, they brought me in. So they'll you know they'll they'll target women in the industry and have them come and talk. So you can sort of relate to the students and help them understand things. Um, the investment clubs are also terrific in, in the U.S. Um, it, it's great training ground. So just in terms of sharing ideas and being in sort of a mixed mixed company uh, sort of thing, um, that's that's terrific as well. And then in the industry, there are a number of groups. There's 100 women in hedge funds. There's a whole slew of organizations that kind of focus on women in different sort of different asset classes, et cetera. Okay, go ahead. Okay, well, thank you, thank you very much. Um, my company, um, six out of seven are women, and then I happen to be the only boy in the company. And then until a couple months ago, we hired uh, a boy because I was a little bit worried maybe, you know, my wife probably thinks a little bit different ways. But then... Um, it's China, right? And the China, or maybe you know, the Southeast Asia. I think women presence is much greater. And then, in particular, uh, this is. You know, I was really surprised. But then, if I go to AGMs in China, more than half allocators are women. And then, I actually didn't notice initially, but I realized a lot of my friends in allocator space are women. And then, it was you know, no difference uh, between men and women, right? And then. Um, so I kept thinking about this, and then how we can actually, you know, the help um, the to change the, this industry as well. And then um, I also found that maybe allocators, I think the percentage of women uh, is relatively high. Right? If I look at the CIOs in uh, U.S. endowment foundations, uh, they are, you know, more female, you know, the CIOs, and I think that was pretty encouraging signs. And then. So we actually, you know, organizing, you know, the uh, it's called Half Sky Project. Uh, just, you know, there are a lot of women, uh, you know, the allocators, and then they're creating some, you know, the organizations. And then, uh, but my, my question is, so one of my partners mentions that, so she, uh, you know, they, they, she's a woman, and then she said, I don't want to be segregated from men, right? Because, you know, we have a lot of, uh, you know, women-focused organizations, but then. It might be a wrong approach because, you know, the, we want to integrate, you know, the men and women, as opposed to just, you know, the segregating women. I, I don't know the right answer, right? And then, um, but then I, I see a lot of potentials uh, by changing these industries. And then, you know, now if you look at these rooms, you know, probably 70 percent, 80 percent men. Right? And then I think hopefully next 20 years it's going to be changed. So just curious what you think. So just to be clear about the question, um, <laughs> so, so, uh, whether it's better to be segregated or to have the support groups, is that right? And why maybe so many women in, in an allocator role? Um, maybe I'll tackle the first one, having been in the allocator role. One of the things that has been very meaningful for me uh, in, in, this, in the seats I've been privileged to have um, has been working on behalf of the missions of the institutions we serve. And so I think, um, I can't speak for all the women who are in that seat, but I will say one of the very special things about the allocator role um, is that you know we are making you know we're, we're trying to increase a pool of capital, not just for the sake of increasing a pool of capital, but you know in support of student scholarships, faculty, um, the educational and grant making you know sides of the clients that we that we serve. And when I was at Robert Wood Johnson, you know on behalf of grant making activities in the health space, and you know in Georgetown in support of the university. So it's um, it's a very fulfilling. It adds Adds sort of that that piece to it. I don't know if you know for sure if that's something that attracts you know all the women that you've seen in that space. But certainly for me, um, that that was a big piece of it. In terms of um, being more uh, segregated versus having the support groups, I don't I don't know that there's a right answer to that. I think it's a little bit of both. <laughs> um, I do think what I can say is that at least again from my my seat, it has been helpful to have. Um, you are integrated in most instances, so having you know having a support group or having women that you can uh, rely on or speak to or have lunches with has been hugely helpful. Um, and and um, and and because I think sometimes in a conference setting we're more dispersed in the crowd, just given you know the the, the ratios, it's nice to have sort of a, a forum where where it's just you know it's it's just women all together. So, but again, I don't think there's a, a right or wrong per se to that. Um, if I may just quickly add. Um, as a younger perspective, the idea is not, and I think 
well, not all women, but most women will agree on this. The idea is not to promote women over men. It's quite the opposite. It's to make sure that it's like not equality, equity, that they have all of these equipments, which previously they have not been able to access. So it's very much, it's not all, it's not about promoting, promoting, promoting. It's just making it a bit more um, equitable. I want to add on to a point that you mentioned, Amelie, is that um, a lot of diversity and inclusion initiatives that start out as a good cause of like wanting to increase women at the bottom levels to make a 50-50 class, when you make it so that when women enter a program thinking they got there because they're a woman and not because they're meritocratic, like be that actually makes like you you get so much inferiority complex from that because you're like oh i didn't get here on my own merits i got here because of my gender and that actually you know is not a good way of promoting women and to amelie's points about it's about just setting the bar at the same place for men and women maybe just one additional point would be um when uh i think it's very important especially around diversity issues i think sometimes there's such a focus on um, making sure that whichever population, you're speaking of women in this case, um, uh, it can sometimes feel like to the exclusion of, so, so to your point, to, to the exclusion of, of the other gender, for example, and it doesn't work unless it feels like um, it's beneficial to, both, to, to, to all participants, everyone involved, right? And so I think as a starting point f for any conversation on this, it has to be um, that it, it's not just specific to women, but that everyone, everyone is involved in the work of this and, and it's beneficial to everybody. Okay, I think uh, one, one last question. Um, thank you all for speaking today. Um, so a lot of you and people have asked about different organizations that support women getting into the industry, whether it's investing, allocating, and I think that's really valuable that you know a lot of men here are looking at that, but I think a really big hurdle is to some of the points you address, like how men relate and interact with them once they're in these roles. Um, and talking to other women in different roles in finance, you know, they'll, I was telling someone this earlier, but they feel like sometimes maybe they're at a disadvantage because the men want it, don't want to like overstep so they on work trips like won't ask to get dinner one-on-one -on -one, and they might then be disadvantaged when it comes to i don't know being selected for a project because they don't have that like bedrock personal relationship with men um, at their different companies so since we're in a room with mostly men i'm curious if you guys could share things like ways that men here can change that that way that they interact with them at their different firms to really be a woman's advocate and not in a way to your point to check the box of having women in these industries but to really help them start from the bottom and grow up i mean i think for my own personal career i would say it's a lot about like sponsorship my first um, managers never saw me as like sophia the female investor they saw me as Sophia the investor, is she performing, is she not performing? How do we help her improve on the things she needs to improve on? And when she gets there, let's help elevate her, whether it's in terms of like always fighting for my compensation, always fighting for my promotion. They just never treated me any different than the male colleagues I had, and that was probably the best thing. It was that everybody is an investor, whether you're a woman or a man, we're just all very unisex um, when, it comes to our, when it comes to our careers. And not putting any light on that, I think, is actually, was actually very positive for my development because I just, I was like, oh, okay, I have to perform. Okay, this is what I need to do more of, less of. And it just helped me build confidence that way. Yeah, I agree. That's why I gave you that example when somebody said, well, the pretty face, a man would never get this kind of criticism of his performance. That's why it was, uh, you know, that was kind of a, a, little, a little hurtful. You could criticize my performance on all kinds of points, but make it about that. So you run into some few points like that. So don't, don't, look, at, don't look at us as, you know, something special woman that needs to be special hand glove handle, just we want the same opportunity and um, you know, we have the same interest and yeah, this job is still more male dominated, but there's no reason for it. I have chosen to create 
uh, by starting my own firm, the environment that would be perfect for me, and it turns out to be a small firm that, that I'm in charge of, because I couldn't find that kind of great environment for, for myself somewhere else, but that's not the only solution. So I'm sure that such places exist, and I'm sure uh, as more women become good at this job and, and, and pave the way, uh, maybe institutions naturally will want to attract them more, incorporate their point of views more. Um, yeah. Alex, I'll, I'll, I'll stop you there and uh, maybe you can answer the next question. Um, so I wanted to go back a little to those attributes that we talked about before about male and female investors. So what I've gotten is that, you know, we do have in some parts different attributes that we could, you know, use to make our jobs, you know, better. And so what I've gotten from this is that it's also a complementary kind of collaboration that we could form. And I wanted to ask you whether you think that if we actually invoke this complementary collaboration, how we could benefit for the future of investment. I just want to make sure that I understand it. So, in, but when you say invoke collaborative, what what exactly are you referring to? I'm not sure. Well, I feel like we could use those different attrib attributes to our own benefit. You know, to to make the environment also more empowering for the two different sides and also use those different attributes, you know, to make the companies stronger in general. Yeah, I mean, I think absolutely that's the goal, right? And, and I think um, there has to just be room for, um, for women and men both, right, to bring different skill sets to the table. Um, you know, the, the teams that I've worked on, I, I feel like I've been quite lucky um, in that I think different people have different um, strengths that they bring. And so whether or not it's, it's a woman or man, I think identifying what it is that an individual brings to the table that is unique relative to everyone else ar around the group um, is, is hugely additive. And if you can pull that out, you know, you'll have the best, the best possible outcome. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm running a shop where I have one analyst, and if I was in charge of a bigger investment firm with a lot of men and women, I would exactly think about it this way. Uh, if I thought the women were better, let's say, at valuing the softer things and they were nicer, I would try to use them in, in a due diligence and in interviews, absolutely. And maybe I would use uh, some, uh, some other more male skills that are better at, I don't know, whatever you can imagine, I would use those skills for uh, that part of due diligence process. There's a lot of ways to get to the final uh, goal, which is let's, uh, you know, let's find really great, amazing investment opportunities and and, and, and use basically our personalities that are different, our points of views that are different, our skill sets and strengths, and th they come in all shapes and sizes, a woman and female and more male, and, and, and make a mix that gets, gets the, gives us the best outcome. And organizations that are okay with that, uh, that are not, you know, well, this is a man, woman, this is, you know, ego, ego sort of battles, but rather, Let's mix it all together and, 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 and create a best cocktail. Uh, I think, um, I think uh, probably we'll, we'll do better than those that, that kind of don't think this way. Yes. And I might just want to add one other thing, and it also speaks to the last question, which is just finding areas of commonality that, that allow you to feel connected um, it, it, to, to your teammates, whether it's, it's a man or a woman. And so the same thing about the fear about overstepping, you know, and again, this is probably a very American comment, but you, know, you might have to look beyond football or you might have to look beyond whatever, you know, golf or whatever the, the very common things are, but it could be music or it could be, you know, so finding, finding ways to connect um, you know, across genders um, and, and really trying to understand the abilities that someone else brings is, is just, is really the key, I think. Do you have anything to add or no? Okay, last question, no pressure. All right, thank you. Um, I have a one-year-old da daughter and I was wondering what you would uh, say about how I should raise and socialize her to give her an equal opportunity in <laughs> male-dominated professions. Thank you. No pressure. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, I, I would say from my experience, that what you mentioned before, when I have a, a, a girl, woman intern, young woman intern, one of the first things I tell her, I can't hear you, <laughs> speak up. Uh, because that's, that's the, that's, that's, so I would tell her, look, um, 
you know, speak up, don't be afraid to, to be louder and to, to uh, you know, maneuver through this world, assuming that everybody else knows more than you, because they don't, and, uh, and you know, develop confidence. Uh, confidence is important, backed up by obviously uh, skills and knowledge and, 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 and everything else that goes behind it, but it's sad when everything else is there, but there is no confidence. And I think that's more likely to happen with women rather than men. Um, yeah, so I mean, I guess I would just say from my own experience, because I have the best parents in the world, and the way they raised me was to always support my curiosities, um, you know, encourage me to do the things I love to do, teach me discipline, aka piano, and do the things I dislike to do. <laughs> um, but it, but, but it, but you know, it paid off. I learned discipline, so thank you, parents, for that. Um, but just, I think a lot of just encouragement and teaching her that there could be other voices in the world. There could be other ways. Stand to your ground. Um, always, never compete with others. Compete with yourself. There's always going to be people better than you. But you are you, and just be happy. And I think like if you push. I mean, my parents are always like, can we write you a note because you stayed past like 11 p.m. You need to go to bed right now for homework. That's not important. Like, I was always taught to motivate myself to find what I like to do, to be with people who made me truly, truly happy, and to think about the types of things that I did and the people I surrounded myself to have a happy, happy life. I honestly think that was the best um, advice I ever got from my parents. So. And, and lastly, I would maybe just say expose her to as many things as, as you can, right? As many different um, uh, ways of thinking and expressing herself and um, exploring the world. And, you know, because at the end of the day, hopefully, in that menu of items, it's, it's all a menu, right? And hopefully you find something on there that, that really gets you passionate and excited. And, that, and that's the end goal. Okay, well, thank you very much to you three. And thank you for the question.